Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Clinic Gym Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Satterley, and it's an honor today to be on with Mike Bledsoe. Mike, how you doing? Doing really well. How are you? Hey, I'm good, man. And can you give everybody who, uh, I don't know how they could not know who Mike Bledsoe is, but for the one or two people out there who don't yet know about the, the mighty Mike Bledsoe, can you let them know who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah, so um, I run the Shrug Collective, which is a network of health and fitness influencers. A lot of folks on podcasts right now, so Barbell Shrug falls underneath that. My own personal show, The Bledsoe Show, uh, Chalk Talk, and a couple other shows, Feed Me, Fuel Me, Body of Knowledge. And uh, so what we do is we, uh, we're a network of shows. Um, I've been running Barbell Business uh, barbell business and barbell shrug for over six years, which are health and fitness podcasts. Uh, we've been ranked number one on uh, iTunes uh, for quite a long time. And then, um, yeah, I come from the gym industry. I ran a CrossFit box from 2007 to 2013. Currently, still own it. Um, don't really run the day to day anymore. Was able to 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 uh, step away from that and do other things as well. So yeah, basically went from gym ownership to podcasting and YouTube channels to now uh, running, you know, a network uh, where we can then uh, further make a bigger impact on the world with education in regard to health, fitness and entrepreneurship. Nice. Well, the reason I love uh, the idea of having you on my show was that you, uh, you made the, the leap from, as people say, gym ownership, which what they're not telling you is that that's when the gym actually owns your ass, um, and to business ownership where you are now a business owner, right? And you're one of the few guys that was able to kind of break out of that. Um, because there's, I'm sure you've seen it thousands of times, but there's so many people that are running gyms and it's really, it really owns them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it, there's a really easy way to know if the gym owns you or if the business owns you instead of the other way around. And that is, um, you know, I see it a lot. I'll, I'll hold a seminar or something like that. And people say, oh, I couldn't break away from for a weekend or I can't break away from my business for a week. And I go, oh, wow. Okay. I see where you're at. You're, you're in a spot you're stuck, really. You know, a lot of people feel like they're in the catch-22. They got to put in more work to make enough money to get away. But if they if they get away, they'll stop making money. And what that means is what they've done is they've given themselves a job. They don't actually own the business. And the business isn't working for them. They're working for the business. And so in, in that case, you might as well just be working for somebody else, in my opinion. Yeah, because when they give themselves a job, it's a low-paying job that has long hours, weekends, holidays, uh, less time with the family, no health care, no retirement, and no uh, no escalating pay structure over the next five years, right? It's like, yeah, I'll do that for and, myself, and, but no, there's no way it would work for anybody that put me through that. Right, and the work never ends. I mean, I think anyone who's had a nine-to-five knows that when they get off at five, they don't even think about their work anymore. But when you're an owner you're always thinking about your work. Yeah. Well, I would love to, I would love to go through some, some of the lessons you've learned along the way, because I know uh, you've helped a bunch of box owners uh, (laughs) develop a true business, right? So if if you got time, I'd love to get some tips on that. What do you think the, the, let's start out with, what do you think the first couple steps somebody needs to take are to, to go from just a, somebody running a million hours in a gym to actually running a business? Um, this well, is, this is going to expand uh, yeah. into 12, 12 days of podcasting right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, it is different for every single person, but I think that the, the typical gym owner, and I've coached a lot of guys and girls, and I think for the most part, uh, it's breaking away from the mentality of needing to work hard to feel valuable. And so I think that we make our work a lot more difficult than it needs to be just so that we can say that it's hard. And I know that sounds, that may, may sound strange, but I think this is, um, this runs rampant in the fitness industry because what, what is, what usually is the difference between somebody who's really in shape and somebody who's not in shape is someone's discipline and ability to put in the work because most people know what it takes. Um, and so uh, the fitness industry is full of, of people who have been really good at submitting their bodies and they've been really good 
at working hard because they see it as a noble thing. And so when you have this idea that working hard is noble, what ends up happening is anytime work is not perceived as hard or difficult, people start feeling less valuable. So the ability to delegate, the ability to put systems in place and the ability to, to, to adopt technology that we know will work to make our business easier, smoother and more profitable, a lot of times is simply not adopted because we have this underlying belief running in the back of our mind, whether it's conscious or subconscious, telling us that if we do this, then we are opting out of hard work and we're no longer a good person. So I think the first thing people have to do is really have a, a, some reflection on, do I really want to have a profitable business or do I want to work hard? And am I willing to sit back and work easy? Um, and if you have the mentality of being able to work easy, now you are ready to delegate. Now you're ready to adopt the best systems that are going to make your your business profitable. And so, uh, and uh, we really need to be looking at, you know, are we going to be making data driven decisions, or are we going to be making decisions that are illogical? And so really getting present with what the numbers are. And I, I think we need to be uh, tracking everything. We need to be tracking how many people are coming through the door, how many people are coming to the website, how many people that are coming to the website are opting in, how many people who are opting into our lead magnet or are interested in the gym are actually stepping in the door. How many of those people stepping in the door are, are converting into members? And collecting those numbers are actually not difficult at all. There's a lot of automated systems to make that happen. And people do not adopt those a lot of times because they refuse to be present with what is. I don't know how many gym owners I've talked to who um, refuse to be present with what is. And that is they, um, I asked them, you know, how many, how many members did you get last week or last month? And they'll say, oh, we signed up 12 people. But if I go, can you show me? And they say, no, I can't show you. And then when we dig into the numbers and we get into what is actually happening, they may have gotten half that many people in the door, but they lost eight. So now they got six people in and signed them up and they lost eight people. So they're actually a net negative too. But they don't want to focus on that. They don't want to be present with what is. And so uh, I, I think that if somebody wants to make the transition to being a real business owner, they cannot avoid the truth. And for people who are struggling in business, a lot of times, if you find yourself struggling from month to month and month, and you're confused about why it's not growing, it's probably because you're not present with what is and you're avoiding what's true. And so you're saying to be present with what is the only way to really truly do that is have accurate reporting and run, run, look at numbers that you can explain to a five-year-old, right? Yeah. Not, not yeah. Some look at, look at those numbers. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You should be able to look at those numbers and you should be able to look at those numbers every day. And, you know, I mean, I, I've been through this myself where I was like, okay, we'll collect the numbers, but I'll look at it once a month because it stresses me out. It's like, no, log in, check the bank account at the beginning of the day, check the bank account at the end of the day, how much money went in, how much money went out being present with what is, is, so, is the first step. So, you know, for a lot of people they are going, oh yeah, I've heard this from every single business consultant and every says that and blah, blah, blah. And, but I mean, you, you were a young, uh, uh, excited box owner, right? When you first opened your gym, like, you know, and, and I, I, were you into numbers at that point or was this like a learn process from getting, uh, taking a couple shots to the chin? Oh no, I, uh, I was not into numbers at all. I, I thought I was special. I thought that, uh, <laughs> especially, especially in this, uh, you know, in 2007, I opened up a CrossFit box and I thought CrossFit was special. So I thought the business was special and I thought everything about what I was doing was special. And, um, the same way that gym owners now, when I go, Oh, what do you do that's special? And I go, Oh, my coaching and community. I'm like, gotcha. The same thing. The guy down the street says is special. And I, uh, and, you know, I, uh, I didn't look at the numbers in the beginning. I treated it like a hobby. I didn't take it seriously. Um, I didn't think very far in the future. I wouldn't let myself. And, because it was scary. And so, <clears throat> yeah, I took a lot of lumps. I, I don't know how many times I had to, my business partner and I had to take 
money out of savings or, you know, like the first year I was in business, I was also getting GI Bill money for, you know, for being in school. And I was taking my GI, GI Bill money to pay rent on my, on my gym a lot of times. And, you said, and that's because. You said this is 2007. So, so you're also. 2008. Yeah. You're also getting like the, it's weird though, Mike, because if I think about that time, you're also getting the confirmation bias that that's the front end of the growth, that meteoric rise of CrossFit, right? So people were coming to you just because yeah. you put CrossFit on those business cards, right? Not necessarily. Uh, it, where I lived in Memphis, Tennessee, in 2000, no one knew what CrossFit was until it was 2010, 2011. Okay. Until right. 2010, 2011, I had to sit down and explain to them what CrossFit was. I'd be at the bar and so <laughs> And someone says, what do you do? I was like, oh, I do CrossFit. And they're like, well, what is that? And I was like, well, it's like weightlifting and gymnastics and track and, and all these things. And they were like, oh, okay, sounds terrible. And so uh, I, uh, so, you know, in the beginning, there was a struggle. And then there was a point where all we had to have was the CrossFit name on the, on the box. And then, and there was, you know, and then, and then there were 10 gyms that were born out of my facility. You know, I, I, I think, almost every single trainer, you know, every gym in Memphis, Tennessee was an athlete at our gym at one point. I think a lot of like established gyms have that experience as well. Yeah. It's like for every gym that opens up, it becomes a little more difficult just for, to ride the CrossFit name, which you can't do anymore in the United States anyway. We know that. So yeah, it's, um, I, I definitely took a lot of lumps. Everything I teach, I learned mostly the hard way. I, I, I really did. And, and back in 07, 08, 09, we didn't have the technology that we have now. So for me to track all the numbers back then was actually more difficult, but you know what? In 09, we started to, we had a clipboard and a pen and paper. And when people came in the door, we, we put check marks for the different times people came in. We compared it against our Google analytics on people who were coming to the website. Um, and there were some things that we had in place that were really good. And we had, some, you know, there was a lot of things that we didn't have. But yeah, most of what I teach is because two reasons. I went through it myself. And then when I go and teach other gym owners, I see, I see that they're doing the exact same thing. And, you know, for me, it's, it always comes down to a mentality piece of like, you know, what's, what's really going on in the background. That's uh, you know, what's the conversation going on in the gym owner's head that's keeping them from, uh, adopting, uh, good delegation and systems and all that, because that stuff is rampant now. I mean, getting, getting an auto responder on your website or getting a good website built is really easy and cheaper than it's ever been before. Right. If that was the only problem though, it, the, the problem would go away. Right. Or if that was the only issue that would need to be fixed. But I, I love the fact that you have the wisdom to say like, it's a deeper seated thing uh, because I see that in, in people we're we're trying to help, you know, clinicians, so chiropractors, PTs add a gym to their clinic. And so many of them, when I say, why don't, you know, when we're doing training calls, bring your staff onto the call and whatnot. It's like, nah, I want to, I want to learn it. And then I'll, you know, I'll share it with them. And I'm thinking, why, like, why, why do you want to take on the, the load of now training them in something new versus just letting them run with it, you know? And, and now that you say that, Mike, I can totally see that in so many of my clients, like this idea that this has to be difficult. It has to be controlled. I have to keep my arms wrapped tightly around this. And I can't just let it go, man. That is yeah. And I think there's also a fear of, you know, if, if everybody knows what I know, then I won't be, you know, you know I won't be necessary. Uh, I mean, I, I deal with that to this day. You know, I catch myself stepping in and wanting to do more work in my own business or I feel like I need to have the best idea or, you know, this or that. And, and that's simply just ego getting in the way of, of your business growing. And, and I've watched myself do it. And I watch other business owners do that a lot too. Fitness industry or not, it's very, very common. Huh. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm you guys have seen so many, uh, and I, I would say that outside of the, it's, it's all the same, right? It's all of us with our, our own fears, our own internal doubt, I guess, uh, that gets in the way of our business growth. So when you have these, these yeah. clients, can you share a, maybe what is it like when you see them finally kind of let go and, and put their ego to the side and delegate a little bit? Well, what usually happens over the next 12 to 24 months uh, in these gyms? Oh, wow. Um, 
Well, it, in the gyms, you, uh, what we normally see is uh, a lot of growth. I mean, uh, I've seen gyms double in size after gym owners adopting, uh, you know, a much clearer mindset. I, I've watched them work way less hours. I've seen them, uh, you know, allow their staff to create programs. I've seen, I mean, honestly, what I've seen is they usually make more money and work less and spend more time with their family and overall just happier. Right. But that, um, <laughs> that's like, uh, that's like saying, you know, you're going to, you're going to lose weight, feel better about yourself, be more attractive and, and make more money is like, you know, what you just said about working less, being happier and making more money seems like uh, defies gravity, right? Like, come on, Mike, the, 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 there's no way that actually works, but uh, I would, yeah, I, mean, I would I, agree with I, you. I think, Go ahead. I, I think, I think the universe is fighting for people to be successful and we are in the habit of not letting it happen. So I, I, I think that we fight success way more of them uh, than we think we are. Um, and I think everyone's heard, you know, get out of the way, you know, and they've heard a lot of business owners who have had a level of success. You know, I think we've all heard them say, you know, I, I started being successful when I, when I get, finally got out of the way. And uh, I think a lot of that would, a lot of what that means and what it's meant for me is, is I'm not nearly as important to my business as I think I am <laughs> in regard to what actually has to get done. And in other ways, I'm, I'm massively important. You know, it wouldn't exist without me, but it's not because of what I do. It's because of who I am. And I think that if a lot of people got to that point where they were just comfortable with who they were and didn't feel like they needed to actually do anything, um, they would, they would, be pleasantly surprised with the results. Well, that might sound a little abstract. Yeah, it does. I mean, but that's okay. Like, uh, you know, when that's the thing of having smart people like you that have gone down the journey is, you know, so it's so scary sometimes, like they say, to, you can't get to second base keeping one foot on first. And um, it's taking that first leap, you know? So when back in 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008, you know, when your gym saw some big growth, when did you feel like, or maybe looking back, you probably didn't realize at the time, but when did you transcend the idea of, I got to do everything to, you know what, I, I've got some great people, I've got some great systems, I've got all that. When, when did that transition occur to allow you to take a week off or a weekend or whatever your, your first marker of success was? Yeah, I think there was, it's hard to say because there's so many layers of that. I mean, I even experienced another layer of that months ago. Um, uh, and every time I do it, uh, it, it, the first time it happened, it happened when I was, I was so tired of the gym. I was so tired of the business that I was willing to, for, willing for it to fail. Like I just didn't care anymore. Wow. I got to a point where I was like, you know what, it, if this fails, that's fine. And you know what? I, it really came out of a, a place of desperation and, and depression. I'm mm -hmm. saying, you know, I'm so tired of this. I'll let someone else, you know, do it or something like that. And it's so funny is there are people who are constantly trying to help out. And then it wasn't until I got to that point of wanting to give up and wanting to walk away that it gave the space uh, necessary for someone else to step in and, and help out. And so. You know, the first time that happened was back in uh, early 2009. And so I, I threw up my hands and said, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I can't do this by myself anymore. And someone else came and helped out. And I wouldn't say that there was a big leap in success in that regard. But what it did was it, it did teach me the lesson. What I saw over my entrepreneurial career over the years is that Every time I let go and gave up, it, the first time it was like complete desperation and complete depression. And then the next time it wasn't so bad. The next time it wasn't so bad. And I would say this last time that it happened, it wasn't out of desperation or depression, but there was a letting go of, you know what? I, um, I see where I've been making myself important in the business by 
making by creating a uh, a company where I have to do so much of the work. You know what? Let's make myself. Uh, let's detach my personal value from how well the business performs. And as I was able to, it was an identity thing. And psychologically, I detached or from from my own personal self worth from the value of the business. And when I did that, it created space for people to be able to step in and do some stuff. So it was the same thing, new layers every single time. But my approach this time was more of how can I be happier? Oh, well, these are all the things I don't like doing. So now I'm going to, and, and being willing to let go of all of it and lose it all um, in order uh, you know, I, I think chasing success is, is actually the problem and saying, Oh, I, I, I want, because success in every person's mind is different. And people think that certain things have to happen in order to be successful. But if we viewed success as simply being happy and not letting anything getting in the, get in the way of us being happy while fulfilling our mission of, of helping people, I think we'd be really shocked at how well businesses thrive after that. Well, uh, can we, uh, can we go back for a second? You, you talked about some depression and I mean, I'll, I'll admit, man, I went through that same thing, like where you're completely despondent and you, you almost want the business to fail. Cause you're, uh, I don't know about your experience, but I was just like, dude, I, every, this thing's driving me nuts. It's tearing, tearing me apart inside. Like I felt dead and, and I think a lot of people, a lot of business owners that I know at some point went through a struggle time like that. Like it's an internal depression or whatever you want to call it of the owner is the biggest threat to the business. And, um, do you see that a lot in other gym owners? I mean, with your experience consulting and whatnot? Oh yeah. You know, I, um, I, well, nobody I, ever I talks about it, dude. Nobody ever talks about it. Oh yeah. It's all, it's all fucking shiny rainbows and unicorns, right? Like it's so great. No, you hire people. And it's like, no, dude, they're like, you d really deal with like a questioning your own self-worth and, and, and doubting it. And it's just, well, you know, if, Go ahead. if you look at my Instagram account, if you look at my Instagram account, you'll just see periods of time where nothing's getting posted. <laughs> Nobody wants to post to Instagram or talk about their thing when they're in a depressed state. <laughs> and then, Usually when you're in a depressed, when you come out the other side, you feel so good. You just want to talk about all the good stuff that's going on. Um, and so I don't, I don't think people actually avoid talking about being depressed. It's just that, you know, uh, going back and, and, and spending a lot of time on that just doesn't feel productive to the person growing something, but it's true, man. It's, it's there. The depression sets. And uh, I think that entrepreneurship attracts uh, people who would be uh, categorized by most psychologists as manic depressant. Um, it's, it's very, very common for someone in entrepreneurship to have really big swings, you know, to, yeah, cause you to gotta go be from manic. being really happy. You got to yeah. be manic enough to get over that hump of starting a business. I mean, that's a crazy idea in the, at the start, you know, if you were level headed, you'd be like, Nope, I'll work for somebody else. I'll get my 3% cost of living, you know, allowance and maybe a 10% raise over the next two years. You'd have to be crazy to freaking go into this. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And, so, um, you know, so I, I, those... I couldn't imagine not being an entrepreneur, but you know, it's, you know, it's been riddled. I mean, you could, it might be better to talk to my wife. She could tell <laughs> you, you know, how many, how many days just in the middle of the day, like, I get off a call and I'm just so like, uh, this doesn't really happen much anymore. But when I was younger, you know, I get off the phone and I would just crawl into the floor and just lay there. It's just like, paralyzed with with stress you know that's that's something and and the thing is is my very close friends who are entrepreneurs they'll they'll say the same thing it's like it's like i won't hear from them for a month and then all of a sudden i'll see them at a party and they'll go man i just came out of a cave that was wild and you know we all look at each other and go, oh wow are you okay you know and I'm like yeah and so it's one of those things where i think if i think a lot of entrepreneurs who don't have friends who are entrepreneurs, they don't, they can't even share that with them because they're not going to get it because they really won't. And then, uh, you know, I'm really fortunate to have a lot of friends who are entrepreneurs. And when someone disappears for a while and they come back and go, what was going on? You, and then, you know, have a conversation about it and go, Oh shit, you know, that was, that's some serious business. 
all right, cool. Glad you're on the other side. Is there anything I can do to help? So it's, it's, uh, it is interesting. Are you a chiropractor or physical therapist working long hours, worrying about lower repayments and missing out on quality time with your family? You can double your income without working more hours by adding a gym to your practice. Clinic Gym Hybrid Solutions has a step-by-step -step guide that dramatically simplifies and speeds up the addition of a fitness center and its monthly recurring revenue. In just six months, you can be on your way to freedom. Visit clinicgymhybrid.com today for a free downloadable PDF and complimentary consultation to get you started. That's clinicgymhybrid.com. What an adventure this life is being a business owner, you know? The one thing I notice yeah. with a lot of my clients is one of the first things that we kind of go over is like, when's the last time you worked out consistently? It's like, oh, two years ago, oh, yeah. you know? And just yeah. one action, because I, I don't know, for me, that was the one big change I saw in my self-worth was when I started exercising, you know, more consistently, even though I had owned a gym, I, I, you know, never worked out there cause you just want to get away from everybody there. And, uh, man right. doing that just drove up my self-worth. I'm like, okay, now I can make smarter decisions that actually value my time. Whereas when I was, when I was depressed, it was like, I wouldn't value my time. I'd spend four hours sharpening pencils because it just seemed like a good idea, you know, like stupid stuff. And, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the question I've been asking myself, like my favorite question right now in when somebody's not happy in their business is, you know, where have I settled? And, you know, where have I settled? What's hindering my ability to be happy and what's hindering my ability to uh, be healthy? And where I've gotten in this entire journey, where I'm at now is nothing gets in the way of health and happiness. There is not one thing in this entire world because that's all we really have is our, our physical body. Um, and we have our, um, uh, and we have our feelings <laughs> and there's really not anything else, you know, that we really, everything else is really outside of ourselves. So, um, if we can have, we have a healthy body, which health and happiness are tied in together. You can't have one without the other and vice versa. But the, uh, you know, I go, where have I been settling? Where have I not been healthy and happy? You know? Um, and I think a lot of times people, you know, they, they don't work out. They're not as physically active as they really want to be. They don't get enough sunlight. They don't get enough sleep. They're sacrificing left and right. They have toxic relationships. They have people in their lives that, that, really make it hard for them to be happy because they're always bringing them down, but they settle to be in those relationships because they've got some story about why they, they should still be talking to this person and spending time with them. And so it's, uh, so for me, you know, it's like, it, there's not enough money in this world that will, uh, that'll have me sacrifice health and happiness. It's, it's the same way. And like, you know, we, as, as health and fitness professionals is I don't know how many times I've had somebody at the gym, they're overweight, they're not getting enough sleep, they're eating terribly. And I go, what's going on? And they're working way too many hours. And they, uh, they refuse to buy healthy food because it's expensive. <laughs> and, uh, and then I look out and I see the car they're driving and they're, they're driving a brand new sports car that costs eighty ninety thousand dollars and yet uh eating high quality food you know they make they make jokes about whole foods like like whole paycheck when they're driving a ninety thousand dollar car and it's like this doesn't make any sense and you value some piece of this thing that you ride around in more than your own body it doesn't make any sense to me and so the same thing happens with the entrepreneurs like we put work or we put business in front of our own health and it's there's no difference but you know, when you got the, you got this person that's not taking care of their health and they're driving a nice car and they're making a good income and they have this big house and we're like, wow, I can't believe they're out of, out of shape. The same thing is we should be looking at ourselves as business owners and go, oh, wow, where am I sacrificing my health for, you know, the sake of somebody else's health or for the sake of, of, uh, you know, making the business run or, um, you know, making somebody in our life, trying to make our, someone else in our life happy that's, that's complaining about us and our own behavior. Yeah, I was just recently at a uh, business conference 
and they had a panel up on the uh, the stage and everybody up on the panel and made more than $10 million in their own business. And I looked at him and I was struck. I said, there's not a single fat person up there. Like it just, right. you know, they can certainly afford the food. They can, you know, afford to sit around and, and, uh, and it's not a money thing. They can, they can not, but every single one of them, you could tell they, they did some sort of exercise and they ate healthy and, and they did all that. And it's, it's not because they, I don't know how to say this. It's like they see the value in themselves and they want to preserve that, Yeah, you know? And so well, many, well, we live, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The, the world we live in right now is it's easier than ever to be unhealthy and it's easier than ever to be really healthy. And there aren't many people that are spending time in the middle. And so what you're going to see is um, a lot of people who are successful entrepreneurs are going to be forced to be healthy because if they're not, they're going to die um, because it's so easy to be unhealthy. The, the Doritos are way, you know, you, I can open up my phone and, and pull up Uber Eats and order McDonald's. And so when, when being unhealthy becomes so convenient, uh, you're, you're just going to see, I, I think we're going to see, and this is totally off topic, but we, we'll definitely see, you know, a, a big segment of our population dying at a very early age and another segment of our population living a very long, healthy life. Um, but I think what you're going to see is uh, modern business people have to, because of the way the, the world is evolving right now, have to be whole systems thinkers and businesses are just systems. And so once you start digging into that world of being a systems thinker and a whole systems thinker, you, it only takes a matter of time before you realize that your own personal health um, is the center of the universe, which is the, the center of your, of the system in which you're operating. And it's the only thing. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's the, the only thing limiting you from your potential. Hmm. And, and it's a, I mean, we started this talking about like, what are the changes you see in business owners, right? When they, they make the transition from, from gym people to, or, you know, from just being a trainer in their own gym and having a job to being a business owner. And it's almost like understanding all those systems is what creates a business owner, right? And even the systems you don't have control of, but it's, that's like a macrocosm of what you're saying is like the microcosm inside of themselves. Like they have to. Correct be these multi-system people like they have to have their address and 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 uh get help with maybe their spiritual alignment and their you know their injuries and their nutrition and their mental state and all those things contribute to them being a great person and when they are balanced like that and they just apply that i don't know if balance is the right word even but apply that to their business it gets real easy real fast just like life does yeah i like the word anytime uh balance comes in i like to replace it with the word harmony and see if it fits better. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but you know, yeah. you know, harmony is more of like a, it's a give and take, you know, sometimes you want high, sometimes you want low and whatever serves uh, the most at, at the right point in time. Um, but yeah, you know, having a whole, being a whole systems thinker um, is uh, as a business owner, I, 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 is the highest leverage skill you could develop. Nice. And, and you have obviously developed tools and, and ways to help people with those things in the world of the gym business. Is that right? With, you said the barbell collective and. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I'll, a lot of, a lot of where I put my attention recently is more on the educational front. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the past where we had barbell logic and we had, uh, we had technological systems to help business owners and coaching programs and, you know, I, I, I saw the market, the, the market has a lot of those offerings. Um, and, uh, there's a lot of really awesome tools out there, but for me personally, the, I've been digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And the thing that I really offer at this point is more of that, uh, more of the coaching that, um, gets people down to the root of what's keeping them from their potential. And so I, right now I host a, uh, I host a, a retreat every two to three months and it's called training camp for the soul. And so at training camp for the soul, we spend six days just digging in and getting everything out. And after that week, seeing the bigger picture 
is really, really easy. And so for me, it's like, I'm always thinking, what is the highest leverage thing I could be doing to create the impact I want to create? And so um, I've been asking myself that question. You know, I've been a health and fitness nerd since I was about 13 years old. I'm 36 now. And I've always been looking for the highest leverage thing I could do. And at, at one point I go, you know, it's not even, it's not an exercise. It's not a food. Um, it's not a program. It's, it's getting down and going, oh, wow. What about, you know, what about the conditioning from my past has created a person, has created this way of being that I, that I don't like or that isn't serving me now. And so for me now, it's, it's how, am I, how do I shift how I'm being from moment to moment? Um, and so that's, that's the work I'm primarily focused on now, which is, again, from, from a whole systems perspective, is we can get down to the center of somebody's universe, which is themselves. If we can dig down into that and see what about themselves isn't serving their highest purpose, um, then we can make the biggest difference. Where, where can some of our folks, if they're ready for that step in their life, where can they find more about that? Uh, they go to trainingcampforthesoul.com. Trainingcampforthesoul.com. So, so we started out with uh, talking about gyms and we ended up with, you know, uh, training camp for the soul. This is, this is how the entrepreneurial journey goes though, right? Like as you realize that the only way to grow bigger on the outside is to dive deeper on the inside. That, you know, it's, that's, it's, that's right. Yeah, it's just no matter if it's what Tony Robbins is teaching people or what, uh, you know, what people find. It's just crazy how I hear that over and over and over again by the most successful entrepreneurs is it's really about developing yourself in in the highest way. And you're right, it has to be whole systems. It can't be, you know, just physically developing yourself or just uh, mentally. It has to be everything. So, well, Mike, we got to wrap yeah. this up because I know that you've got a, uh, you've got adventures to go adventure, man. Like, uh, you just got, where did you get, you just got back from Europe. Is that right? Yeah, I just got done. Um, just, uh, my wife and I spent two weeks in France and just got to see amazing sights, got to see things that were old, things that were like 2000 years old built by human beings. And it just blew my mind. Um, yeah, that's amazing. It was awesome. So, what, what's the most important thing you saw? So what? What's the most impactful uh, thing that you saw? I remember I went to Rome and I just couldn't, the, the Pantheon has, uh, it's, it's in the middle of Rome. It's got this hole in the ceiling. And I'm like, why is there a hole in the ceiling? And it was a room that was a calendar. So you could tell the date by what, where the sun in that hole focused its light. And I was just like, what a crazy idea. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. It was absolutely blew my incredible. Mind. Yeah. I want to go see the Pantheon. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I got to see this, um, this, this, I think it's called an abbey, uh, basically a really old, uh, like, uh, where monks lived. Yeah. It's an abbey. Yep. And, yeah. An abbey. And, uh, and it was, it dated back to, you know, basically one BC around that time <laughs> frame. And I was just, blown away by uh the the architectural advancements over time he had the roman architecture and then before it became gothic and it they uh we had a really great tour and and she was just telling us about how um uh how these monks were were living and then how the involvement of the roman empire and the politics and how that impacted all that and just just uh learning about the history of between the church and the empires over, and the, the nations over and the Kings and Queens over that period of time was just fascinating. It was really, really cool. And then the same thing at Notre Dame went and saw that. And uh, Notre Dame was just for me really cool because there was so many different um, it's Gothic. And so it has, uh, it was built later and it has so many like Egyptian uh, things, uh, symbolism built into it. And there was just, like all these different types of symbolism built in from uh, different parts of the world into this one church. And, and uh, there was, you know, our guide was able to tell us about all this different types of controversy that went over the years. And it was like one thing was super popular, you know, back in, 
1600, but in 1800, it was outlawed. So they're destroying things. And I go, wow, how do we do that now? We do that a lot now too. So one thing we, we think is really cool hundred years ago, we don't like now. So we just destroy it. Interesting. So yeah, I, I thought it was really fascinating. Yeah. It's, I mean, if you want an education, just travel, that's all you got to do. Right. I mean, even out of your own state, just, yeah, that's, it's, but other countries, it's unbelievable. So, so make yeah, sure that you build go, a, go and get go a, go, go and get a tour out of, you know, something somewhere. And the, the amount of history I was able to, to uh, learn in that period of time was just incredible. So the, the lesson from this podcast is, uh, make yourself a multi-systems thinker, get yourself balanced and in harmony, uh, step away from your gym and then go travel. That's basically start to finish what we covered in this podcast, right? Yeah, that sounds like an awesome life to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, Mike, how can they, uh, how can they reach out or find you? Um, you said uh, training camp for the soul is one area. And then uh, how can they find the barbell or the, sorry, the shrug collective? Yeah, you can just go to shrug collective.com. I also have my own personal podcast where I cover all sorts of topics at the bledsoshow.com. And then uh, you can find me on Instagram, Mike underscore Bledsoe. It's a really easy way to message me um, is over there on Instagram. So yeah, just make sure to check out all that stuff. Um, real quick again, shrugcollective.com, thebledsoeshow.com. And then for Instagram, Mike underscore Bledsoe. Fantastic. All right. Well, on behalf of Mike Bledsoe, this is Dr. Josh Satterley saying, go out there, get in harmony, maximize your license, and then live the life you dream of. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for listening to Clinic Gym Radio. If you're ready to double your profit without working longer hours, please visit clinicgymhybrid.com and find out how easy it is to get started on your path to freedom. That's clinicgymhybrid.com.